you to turn to today, Mark chapter 11, and then we'll be looking at chapter 14, Mark chapter 11, for our Lord's table, our communion service today, and we'll be passing out the elements in a few minutes, but we believe that there are some scriptures that can bring light to some of the things that we're going to be doing uh, for the ordinance of communion. And it is something that is, we say ordinance and not sacrament because sacrament has an edificacy in the area of salvation where ordinance is something that's just commanded for the church to do. And that would go along with one other ordinance, and we believe that these are the only two that the New Testament share with Christians, with, with New Testament Christians, and that's baptism. And we can do this as often as we believe the Lord wills in our church here. Baptism is something that you do once you become a believer in Jesus Christ. But if you look over at the table, this comes from out of Luke, and it's then mentioned again in 1 Corinthians, we do this in remembrance of him. That's what he told the disciples. This do in remembrance of me in Luke chapter 22. But now we're going to be in Mark chapter 11. And if uh, Nick, you'll go to that next slide. We sure would appreciate it. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Mark chapter 11, now in verse 1. Jesus sent two of his disciples. The other gospels tell, him, tell us who they are. It's, it's Peter and John. Okay? And he said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. The next verse and they went away and found the colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And I can't imagine that journey going down the streets of Jerusalem there to look for this, what we know is a donkey, but it's a, a young, a colt being from four years and younger. In verse 5 it says, and some of these, those standing there said to them, hey, what are you doing? Untying that colt. Verse 6 it says, and they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Verse 8. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, meaning God save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I think about those branches, as Marty mentioned, it is Palm Sunday, and it's tradition of the church the week before Easter. We believe that this is the first day of the week. It could have been late Sunday, which would have been the Jews' Monday, but I have six sable palms on my, my lot. Then one of them is eight foot tall. The other two are about, the two next biggest ones are about four to six foot tall. And as you can guess, they, because of the freeze, were as brown as brown. Sable palms, as you get closer to the, to the stump, have thorns on them that are about an inch and a half to three inches, depending on the, the size of the, of the stump itself. I want you to know I got stuck so many times, I cleared all the branches off. And all I wanted to do was lay them down somewhere. But if, if you notice, it says these are leafy Branches. I picture that these palm leaves were very green and that they had just cut them off, right? Whereas my palm trees, um, they were pretty brown. But I promise you, those needles stuck very, very hard. I finally got two sets of gloves to wear as I cleared that land there. But let's look at verse number 10 now. Blessed is the coming, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, which would seem to believe that it now had become past 6 p.m. and time for him to go home, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So he walks into the temple, looks around at what's happening, because we know what he's going to do the very next morning. He's going to clear the temple, isn't he? 
He goes back to Bethany, basically, we believe, to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. I want to skip ahead a few chapters and go to Mark chapter 14. And Nick, hit that next slide here. And I want you guys to look at verse 12. Mark chapter 14. Because these two events so are tied into each other. Palm Sunday and then what would become the Lord's table. But initially with the Jews, it's Passover. Mark 14 verse 12, it says... And on the first day of unleavened bread, and when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us to go and prepare us for you to eat, prepare for you to eat the Passover? In verse 13, it says, and he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him. So the first instructions were, to untie the colt, the donkey, now you're finding someone who's going to be doing a household chore that would normally have been in their traditions, the, the ladies' work. You're going to find this man out of the crowd and throngs of people. Ask them about the upper room. In verse 14 it says, And whenever he enters, he says to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room? We know this to be the upper room, right? Where I meet where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. They're prepared for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this time. And Lord, for the reading of your, your, your precious word. And we pray, Father, not that just mentally we'll make a connection between the triumphant entry and Passover, a.k.a. the Lord's table. We pray, Father, we'll make a connection with you and that, Lord, we will see your glory this morning. And I pray, Father, that I will just be an instrument just as Debbie was in worship and how beautiful it was for her to express that song that you had given her. She was an instrument in worship today. I pray, Father, to do the same, that I will just be a vessel that will hide behind the cross, and Lord, that you will get the honor and glory. Whatever thoughts that have been put on the page, Lord, cannot match up to what has been put on the page of Holy Scripture. And Lord, we don't worship the pages, we don't worship even the words. Lord, we worship you, but Lord, you are the Logos. Lord, you are the very thought and expression of God. And we do have that recorded for us of these events that we now celebrate. And we're thankful, Father, for that. And we praise your name and we give honor and glory to you. We pray, Father, for those who couldn't be here. And we ask, Lord, that you will minister to them. Lord, for some, it's very serious illnesses. For others, Lord, they're going through situations in their lives and their families that, Lord, only you can attend to. The frailty of human means will not. We're asking, Father, that you will bless those, Lord, who are also worshiping with us, Lord, this day to bring honor and glory to your name as we meet together collectively as the church. And I pray, Father, that we'll have a greater understanding this Easter this time of resurrection. Lord, may we, as a result, be the changed, as we sung about just a few minutes ago, the transformed people that you've called us to be. For it's in Jesus' precious name, and it is in his holy name, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I love quotations. As a kid, I would look at calendars or I would look at different expressions that people would have. A lot of them coming from one of my heroes, Yogi Berra. Y'all know some of his great quotations. They were hilarious. Stating the simple obvious. But others were sports figures. Many of them were there to help us live successful lives. And you still see that. Now we see them a lot on the internet. I'm going to tell you that some of the favorite ones I have now come from my favorite sports team, that is the San Antonio Spurs. Down just a few miles south here, we have a team, an NBA basketball team, that had for 20 years the most winningest organization of any professional team in all of sports around the world. 
And they've won five national uh, worldwide championships, the NBA championships. They had a motto, an expression that I'm going to give you that helped them to be successful. And that since their big stars have retired, they're on a rebuilding scene, but we think we will. I remember when San Antonio had teams that were just terrible and all the different things, but I could go down there back in the day when no one was going to those games and get in for $6. Now you can get in for the upper decks for about $200. Not going to do that. But here was their motto, and this is an interesting motto. It's a quote. It is simply called pounding the rock. Anybody ever heard that associated with San Antonio Spurs? It's mainly given to the basketball players. And the reason why they say pounding the rock, it takes the form of what would be a sculptor. And the sculptor has to take a rock and he turns it into this beautiful piece of art. But the way he does that is the same stroke day in and day out in chiseling that rock. It is pounding the rock and he cannot deviate from the actual method of what he does. And they took that and said, we have to do the same thing in practice. We have to have the same philosophy, the same way we do things each and every day. Thus building the expression, practice makes what? Perfect. And that is true for all things that we do. Repetition helps us. So I love expressions that bring it about. Another sportsman, sports quote, no pain, no what? No pain, no gain. Now, for years, I was told that that was given by famous coaches, in particular, another basketball coach named John Wooden. Only to find out that wasn't true, he stole it. The originator of that quote is actually Benjamin Franklin. And of course, Benjamin Franklin, the famous, unbelievable inventor, scientist, philosopher, writer, great wit, spontaneous wit. He wrote Poor Richard's Almanac, which is one of the best American pieces of literature through the years of a monthly uh, uh, almanac that he put out. He's the one who quote this. And I want to read it the way that he quoted in 1745. He, he put it this way, no gains without pains. In school, we learn so many quotes by Benjamin Franklin. He's the father of the Bill of Rights. He's the, he's, he's the statesman of statesmen that really helped John Adams put together that document with Jefferson putting the, in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, my favorite one that he wrote that we learned in school was, he who lies down with dogs shall rise up with what? Fleas. And that is true. I've actually lived that. I know that all you guys that have the dogs sleeping in the bed, you would disagree with me. Don't let them dogs outside this spring. It might happen, right? Now, in 1734, he had another one. Better slip with the foot than tongue. Better slip with the foot than tongue. A slip of the tongue is, not, is a lot more painful is what he's really saying. In 1739, he wrote this one. He who falls in love with self will have no rival. So we learned all these different quotes that were so, so great in school, all coming from Benjamin Franklin. Glass and china and reputation are easily cracked and never well mended. Haste makes waste. Great one, isn't it? And so the one that was the most famous that I remember by my teachers, though, failing to prepare... You're preparing to fail. And all my teachers would say that, especially when I was about ready to take a test. And they would attribute it to Ben Franklin. He didn't say that one. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail was actually said by a pastor, a fellow named Williams. Franklin never wrote it. And they on the internet, you can find scores and scores of scores of pages where they'll put that quote up and have Ben Franklin's name underneath it. And it's not true. It was given by a pastor who wrote that in 1919, year before the great uh, uh, bankruptcy of America. And, and so we see that that happens sometimes. You get attributed to things that your reputation gets better and you get quotes that you have. Abraham Lincoln, the same thing happened with Lincoln. Lincoln was given quotes from it. I want you to look at this quote today. This do 
in remembrance of me. And may that burn in our brain because it was said by Jesus Christ. It's not witty. It's not something that would stand out as far as what the rest of the world would know. But this church and believers around the world should remember when we take the juice, when we eat the bread, and take the juice, which we'll do in a few minutes here, it is the thing that should be remembered of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ did for us. So we entitled the message today, Preparations. You know, you've heard another quote, the demons in the details, right? And yet, at the same time, we just gave you two accounts of the triumphant entry and the Passover and the preparations that were made. Jesus made them and didn't include the disciples. He just told them how they would fall out. Details are important. We spend most of our life preparing things. If you think about it, hours this week, last week too, as I began preparing for the Lord's table, even though I've done this for over 40 years, I wanted this to be something different and unique. And so I spent time in God's kitchen baking and putting the elements together for what we are experiencing right here and right now. And I say all that to say one reason, other reason is what my mom would say is, I've got it from their kitchen. It's on the table. Let's eat. And of course, we're coming to the table today. And I don't want you to come today with the sense of mor morbidness of because of the, the cross of Christ. And I've surely made those presentations like that before. And we know that the price that was paid was no value. There's, it's insurmountable valuable. But what I would like for us to realize is that as we come to the table, it is in preparation for a celebration. We will be doing that symbolically next week, won't we? We will be symbolically preparing for what's going to happen in eternity. Because I want you to notice that when he brought these preparations out, and in particular, when he said this in Mark, he said, I'll not drink again of the cup with y'all until we celebrate with our Father up in hell and heaven. And that's going to be the preparations of all preparations. So all of life is nothing but preparations. You go on a trip, you got to get the car ready. You got to pack. You got to make sure that the itinerary is right, your plans of when you're going to be there. You make preparations for work and you plan out your work. I will say that what was the ins ins inspiration of this message was looking at Ben Franklin's Daily Planner. You can find this on the internet and it's one of the greatest organizational planners that you could ever find of how that he put the grand ideas for the day on one side and then the hourly aspects of it and he would not move the grand ideas over to the hour hourly until he knew that this was exactly what the day was going to be and he planned his days like that and he lived and that's the reason why he was able to write and invent and become the person he was a deist it's the greatest planner that anybody had seen that's been copied many times over before but at the same time it was preparation. Jesus Christ does these preparations for the events. And I spent some not only time in preparation for the event, but we also spent time in preparation for the elements of, of the Lord's table. And that is important today for us. But I want you to realize that preparations in your life are important. I don't take it lightly that you guys prepared to be here today. I know that it took time. I know that there's an element of sacrifice. And I know that there are other things that you could found, sit here and be thinking that would be more valuable to you in things in your life than coming here. In fact, you could make the point, oh, I could catch this online and fast forward it even. That's even better. But you took time to be here so that we could corporately worship together and bring honor and glory to the one who died for us. So preparations in the kitchen. Preparations in travel, preparations at work, preparations in education, preparation even in sports. And we have preparations that our Lord just showed us. This Palm Sunday, I believe, was 
what was to happen was a time of preparations, not just getting the donkey, not just getting the, the route through the Eastern Gate. I believe it was times of preparation in the sense that even the Lord knew that they were going to shout Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, and lay down their cloaks and palm leaves. The two events that led to ultimately the death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the triumphant entry and the Lord's table, which at first was the Passover, but then changed to the Lord's table for the New Testament, leads and speaks to the gospel itself. These two events, the triumphant entry and the Lord's table, were preparing us so that we might be able to understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news, the God spell, that we can understand that we're to take this forward and live this out in our lives. And it takes preparations for us to do that. I want you, if you would, to, to look at this next slide here. Skip, get to this here in verse 12 and in the passage. And on the first day of unleavened bread, Mark, Mark 14, verse 12, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go? and prepare for you to eat the Passover. So they were looking at what they would normally have done. This was his third Passover with these guys. He was with them for the most part for three and a half years, at least for the, the main th uh, four uh, apostles. And so now they were used to this. There was something that they would do. All Jews would have to go to Jerusalem and they would make sure that this was their one of their main high and holy days and what we forget is that when it says the first day of the unleavened bread, that was a great time of celebration of understanding that they were to eat this in haste, not even put yeast in it so that it would cook faster and leave out of the exodus of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. And then, of course, they would sacrifice a one-year-old perfect lamb to do this. And each household did this. By the time Jesus comes around, and this is the part that's amazing to me, was that they would combine smaller families to groups of 10. If you went over 20, they would divide that group. So any time around that group, they could put together, because they were not living in homes, they were coming from all around the known world, and mostly from Israel, large populations in the Galilean area, Judea, obviously being the most populated, two million people hanging around seven acres of land of old Jerusalem. Two million people in the days of Jesus Christ all being around. We have that many people in greater Austin. Yet it feels like it takes me half a day to get to South Austin. We have two million people, right? That's amazing in and of itself. Are y'all are picking up what I'm laying down here? Here's the other thing. That many families to have that many lambs? He, we just read about him going into the temple and surveying what's going on. We know he's going to cleanse the temple. Not everyone could bring the sheep. Poor families could use turtle doves. But most families wanted to make sure that they had the lamb. Or they would join in with other families to have the lamb. Josephus tells us that there were 250,000 lambs slain this week. 250,000 lambs, all on this small little parcel of ground. Every Jewish family came, and it was important because it was their emancipation day. It was their setting, recognizing the time when they were set free. That's what God was showing this. I want you guys just to get, I'm going to give you just a graphic of a possible, look at this here, go to slide nine here and show this here. This area was the Roman temple, it's Herod's temple, and the temple aspect there is on your far left, and here the eastern gate comes into play, and it's just a short walk. The temple area is very small, and it was going through what this, where this bridge is at, it's called the Kidron Valley, and here the blood would run out with the sacrifices of the 200, and they made it so that they would sacrifice in the temple area on the altars, and there would be multiple sacrifices going on for about three to four days, and then they would try to wait 
until what was called the 14th of Nisan, the first day of unleavened bread. So all this activity is happening on this Sunday of Palm Sunday. They're purchasing the animals, they're sacrificing the animals, going on in rapid succession. And believe me, believe you me, they were making a ton of money selling this. They upsell for the holiday. Y'all catching what I'm talking about? It's summertime, gas prices go up. Well, it seems like right now they're going up everywhere. But know this, that this was an operation that was coming forward just like we do in all our holidays. But Jesus stops seeing the crowds. They know he's coming. They know that Lazarus has got a bounty on his head because he's raised Lazarus from the dead after being four days in the tomb, just two miles away. He stops and he fulfills prophecy by having prepared a donkey that the men came in, that John and, and, and Peter came and got for him. And he rides on this colt. The mother, and a couple of the other gospels say the mother of the colt actually was with them. And he rode on this, fulfilling God's prophecy. Going into, along the path, and you can imagine just like our hill country, it's very windy, going into the eastern gate. Now that's important too, because when you see the eastern gate there, it is now blocked off. And it's been blocked off for about 1,600 years. The Bible says that it will not be opened up until Messiah comes back. The latter prophets said this in the, in the minor prophets. But now here they're not thinking that. Because they're thinking that the blockage had to be happened with Roman domination. But they could still enter into the gate. But he comes in with this donkey. So, lamb selection day, animals are starting to be sacrificed, blood's flowing, and this is how they thought they made peace with God. And now the only thing that we've got to do now is kick out the Romans and let's get the war going. But that was not Jesus' plan, was it? He looked at this whole mockery of what they thought was communion and fellowship with God, and come Monday, he's going to flip tables. And the money changers of what was being made for selling of the livestock is going to be totally ripped out and it's going to create a problem this year for Passover. Because all of a sudden, when you're tipping over tables and you've got animals around and they're running, as you had to bring them up into the temple, animals go scurrying off. It's created a couple of, a lot of commotion. And, and here we're talking of the thousands and thousands, just throngs of people, just the smells alone. Would have, would have blown us away. And so Jesus does this to prove but one thing. Guys, you want Passover? I am the Lamb of God. Because just on the other side of Jericho is the Jordan River. And three and a half years ago, John the Baptist saw Jesus come right after he had turned down the same religious crowd that's operating business here in that temple. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Sanhedrin council, and all their priests. And John the Baptist said, no, you can't get baptized for repentance. Jesus walks into the water, and John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God. Listen to this. Three and a half years earlier, who takes away sins of the world. All this rigmarole that they were doing had become a mockery of what was supposed to be a holy time and a holy moment. And the religious crowd and the political leaders had made it a money grab. They were upsizing their treasury. And believe me, it was very beautiful. Herod was very proud of what was to happen and, the, and, the, and the, his, his three sons who later had, this was a very, Herod being half Jew was very real. Look at slide 10 here. This is what I want you guys to see. It's totally opposite of this, of this mockery here. Hit that next slide. Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats, and we could add sheep, to take away sins. No animal. Because later on in chapter 10, look at verse 12 in the next slide here. This is so good. 
But when Christ had offered for all, for all time, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He only had to die once. But here we had animal after animal. And not just one time of year during Passover or even at the high offering of in the fall when they had literally the, the highest offering of high offerings. No, they did this daily. This was nothing new. Business was regularly going on. It just got bigger on these high days. And so Jesus is going to show them that John the Baptist was right. And Herod, this may be your temple, and you may have been the one who cut John the Baptist off, but I am the Lamb of God. So Jesus isn't concerned about the details. He'd already had that planned out. And I think he probably kept it from the disciples so that Judas wouldn't know in a human sense. I do understand that. They had been used to planning things out before. That's why they came to him and said, we've got to get things prepared. We're always about preparations, right? Jesus took care of all that. Either he did that by direct intervention or he had actually laid it out sometime in Bethany. Who knows? He may have used surrogates like the ladies, Mary and, and Martha. Martha always loved to do preparations. We're not sure, but the one thing we do know is he wasn't concerned about the preparations. He was concerned about the hearts of Israel and the hearts of the people who thought they were communing with God. And they did not recognize the significance of what the Passover was supposed to be. It had become a mockery. So now he tells them we're going to meet in the upper room and handle this after this triumphant entry. And Marty's exactly right. It's the same crowd. How could they turn and say, Hosanna and glory to God in the highest, and then turn around five and a half days later and say, crucify him, crucify him. It's because they were in the business. They were professional. You know what just happened this past week? There has been several lay members exposing megachurch pastors, and some of them not necessarily heavily in error, but heavily in greed, wearing $4,000 pair of shoes, wearing all kinds of jewelry. And it's reminded me of back in the days of the PTL and TBN and all that stuff going on. It still goes on today, doesn't it? And, and believe me, it's not that you should have to have people of God living in poverty. But what I am saying is that things of riches should not overtake you. They were making money after money after money. That's the reason why they weren't concerned of picking up the coins when Judas threw them down. Oh, I, I mean, I see money being thrown down somewhere. I saw 50 cents this past week in the elevator. You just you thought you'd see me. I just don't like to see money being wasted. I think it's wasted, right? And so I just typically grab it. It's not that I'm in love with money. I just think it needs to be used and stuck it in my pocket. You know? Didn't go around seeing whose quarter this was. Okay, it's your quarter. Well, you need to tell me the date then. <laughs> it's not happening. The Jews had so much money around that time. Jesus wasn't concerned about the details. He was concerned about the heart. And by the way, what's interesting about this, we talk about the money of Judas and all the things where he throws it down. This is the same man who was invited to the Passover. And I saw this as a tattoo this, this week on television. Literally, all it said on the, on the person's forearm, I thought this was amazing. Jesus, Judas ate too. Judas ate too. A-T-E. And I'm God. In the flesh and this man's betraying me I, 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 I marvel at that that he took communion with them now he leaves as soon as the morsel of bread is finished but he's there it's almost like God with his open arms are saying Judas here's one more chance I know you hate me I know you I think you think I failed you in so many different things and how many people across this globe does the exact same thing with God each and every day God, you failed me. I don't understand this. And here's God all along saying, come, Judas. Come and truly commune with me and let go of these earthly things. Jesus is the true Passover 
lamb. Go to slide 12, Mick. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 says it this way. Cleanse out the old leaven. And that's what they were doing in Passover. They, didn't, they were eating this in haste. They were getting set free as slaves when they were imprisoned by Egypt. And they're leaving. And so they bake the bread fast. And they don't put the leaven, the yeast in it. Now notice what it says here. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. That's what we're to be. We're temporary here, folks. We're here for a short time. Live for Christ. Because notice what the end of the verse says. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. That's what God has called you and me to Quit being concerned with the details. Life's temporary. I, not that you can't have things in order. You need to have things in order. But you need to also understand that God's not concerned with preparations. He's concerned with, are you going to drink the cup? That I'm going to drink. And he's not talking about this little thing of juice. Are you going to be part of the body of Christ? Are you going to commune with me and be broken and give your life for others? If you do that, then you're going to be the believer that God has called you to be. But if not, you're going to suffer. Go to slide 13 then. Verse 14, chapter 14, verse 22 says, And as they were eating, he took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. That's what God's calling you and me to do, is to be broken, isn't he? We're to live that. We are the body of Christ, and the bread represents that when it's just broken. In other words, it's humility. By the way, his body was never broken on the cross. As bad as he was beaten, as bad as he was ripped to shreds, his body was never broken. But then it says, take this my body. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they drank, they all drank of it. We know the symbology of that. But it's, it's a picture of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing, amazing, powerful thing. This picture of communion of the God of all creation. And we get to have part of that. He sheds his blood. We, as a result, partake of the cup of that. And we also know that God has a cup for us. He gives his body, and we also get to partake of the suffering of that. That is the humility and the calling of Christ in our life. And that's why I said a few weeks ago, when we were in Revelation chapter 1, we have no rights. We are to surrender our body, and our life's blood for the cause of Christ. By believing in Jesus Christ, we are taking up our cross. And we are symbolically showing his death, but we are also realistically showing his resurrection. I want you to notice here, and go to this next slide, because in verse 24, this is my blood of the covenant. This is the New Testament. This is the promise that's poured out for many. Truly I say unto you, this is what I love here, and we referenced this a few minutes ago, verse 25. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What's he saying? He's saying, don't mourn what is happening. I know this is going to be a fearful time. I know you're going to see things that you never think that would happen to the Son of God. And I know that we can feel that way about our lives today with the current state of the world and all the things that are happening. But don't mourn. What is he saying? He's saying live in victory. This is this time that we will drink it new with him and we will go. When the martyrs over in Europe went to Christ, went to their deaths as martyrs on burning stakes, they held their Bibles or had them chained around them. And they said that they not only had the look of an angel. They smiled. As God was allowing them to be martyred. And it's an amazing thing that we got just the opposite. That we think we're owed these things. Our salvation is in Christ. And that's what we celebrate. I'm here to tell you this table is as, as small as this element is. You know these wafers are about as big as your thumbnail. On these little cups, this little thing of juice, we are to have the celebration of celebration. Because we know that Friday is here, but Sunday's coming. And that's why we need to have that celebration. Forget living in the doldrums and the mulligrums 
and live like you've been called to live. Understand persecution is going to come, but it is not going to affect you in any way, stretch of the imagination. Go to slide 15 then, because I love this. We'll transition into the eating of it. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised. They better put a price tag on Lazarus. He is dead four days. We learned in Bible study this morning that after three days, you're going to start stinking like the deer on the side of the road. That's not a good smell. They had, it, well, I won't even get into it. I told y'all I wasn't going to talk about it, didn't I? But it's a terrible, terrible smell. Jesus Christ takes the smell and changes it and makes it right. Because look at slide 16. Here's where it comes from just a different, different. Nick, hit this slide. And it says, the large crowd, verse 9 now, of the Jews learned that Jesus was there. They came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus. You see how stinking they were? So he had raised, been raised from the dead. Lazarus was four days in the tomb. But they're the ones who are stinking. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. And then keep going. But because of account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Why? Because of the resurrection of one. We have that chance to be that magnet to other people when we get excited about these things. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Keep going, Nick. So they took branches and palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on the donkey's colt. Now here's the interesting thing. You remember the picture of the temple I just showed? When he came up to the temple, the Bible says something that's very interesting. Jesus started weeping for the daughters of Jerusalem. He was weeping. Now you say, well, Pastor Bob, you just spent time talking about a celebration. Why is Jesus, as he slips off the donkey, starting to cry? You know why? It's because they didn't see what the old prophet Zechariah said when he wrote about this. They didn't see what this was supposed to be about. Kings were to ride on the donkey, but the king that rode on the donkey was to represent peace. And they couldn't see that he was there so that they could make peace with God. The king that rides on a white charger, catch this, Roman history, there to make war. We know that's what's going to happen in the second coming, isn't it? But he comes in riding on the donkey of the humility of a beast of a burden of a beast of burden. The Jews are supposed to know this. Go to slide 19. I want you guys to see this here. Greatly, O daughter, re greatly rejoice, greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, a very young animal. And he's riding and he's coming into the temple and they're shouting and wanting the victory of a war, not of humility and a right relationship with God. That's what we as the church should be showing is true humility and true passion for souls and a love to do what God's called. I hope that Capstone Baptist recognizes this. And John is bearing this out. Mark bears this out, that this was a donkey. Generals and kings, when they had great victories, would ride in on their chargers with a slaves behind them carrying sacrificial armies. And that's what the Caesars wanted when they would ride into Rome. And guess what? Not only that, Everyone would stand up and proclaim them as God. They were recognizing Jesus as God, but Jesus is weeping because they thought he was there to make war. That's not true. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians and go to this next slide, chapter 2 and verse 14. But thanks be to God who is in Christ always leads us in. Now I want you all to catch this phrase here. I should have highlighted it. What does it say? Triumphal procession. And though he, through us, spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of who? Him everywhere. You know what that means? You take a rose and you crush it 
and the fragrance goes everywhere. When Mary brought the alabaster box and she broke it, the fragrance went everywhere. Our lives are to be crushed for his honor and his glory. And we need to bring that passage, passion of making peace, of truly understanding that we're to take up our cross and live that crushed life so that the world can smell the sweet fragrance of who he is. Look at this next slide. Because it says this, at the feast of, of, of this time, the preparations were being made. But during supper, look at verse 2. When the devil had already put it into the heart, he loved him. But he's still allowing him to be here. We're not going to take some kind of test of spirituality to see who, see who partakes of the, of the table. It's not my job to be the judge over that. It's between you and your God and your peace with him and living that sacrificial life. You be the judge of that. If Judas can partake of it, guess what? I've been part of churches, especially in the Baptist denomination, where we would tell people, eh, sit out. And it was closed communion. You know what? We let God. All I'm here to do is fish for souls. Be a fisher of men, right? Men and women, boys and girls. You know what? Guess what? God's the one who's going to clean the catch, not me. Y'all picking up what I'm laying down here? That's so important. And so many religions have done the same thing that the Jews were doing back in that time. The devil's entered into the heart of Jesus Iscariot because he's seen this crushed Savior, this humble Savior, and he's not seen the war king. Go to the next slide. And in verse 27 of chapter 13, and he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. What thou doest, do it quickly. And at the end of the chapter, it says, and so after receiving the morsel of bread, he went out immediately into the night. God's calling us to be the church that is pure and right, not in our eyes, but in the humility of Christ. Because go to this next chapter here, Nick. Because here's what I want you to see, and this is what we conclude with here today. This is the transition of why Mark and John coming together makes this so beautiful. Of a crushed spirit and a fragrance that goes up to what Corinthians even talked about. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I tell... This is right after chapter 13. He's beginning to teach them right there in the upper room. He's not made it over to the garden yet. Would I have told you that? I go to prepare a place for you. And look at verse 3. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that I, where I am, you may be also. And when he says this at the communion table, at the Lord's table, Passover having been eaten, and, and interesting enough, this eating of the Passover would have had to take more than just one day. It couldn't have just been done all, all Friday. But I do know this, that on Friday at 3 o'clock, right when the final lamb was crucified, the actual Passover lamb by the high priest, when it was crucified, Jesus yelled up on the cross at 3 p.m. Friday, it is finished. He became the sacrificial. And you say, well, how did Jesus and the disciples do that the day before? They did it the day before by simply knowing that there were so many thousands and millions of people that were partaking you couldn't get this all in in one day and they understood that and they they believed that god was okay and jesus surely never condemned them for it he participated in it but get this here's the picture that's so beautiful marty if you wouldn't mind to come up here with a tray to grab the tray and pass out the elements I'll give you a time to take the plastic and tape it off the top. Don't eat the, the wafer yet. Don't eat the, the bread yet. But as we said, Jesus was weeping. He had, his heart was broken. But now he's at the intimacy of the Savior and all the preparations have been made. They are now partaking of this one cup together. Here's the most beautiful thing. After they do this, he says, to, after he says, I'm not going to drink again until I drink again with you in the kingdom. Look at the very next verse. 
I want all eyes, okay, if you got your plastic off, I want all eyes to look at verse 1 again. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Here's what he's about to say. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were many mansions is what the old King James says. And trust me, a room with God will be a way more than a mansion than anything we can imagine. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now, guys, I want you to get this. I want you to look at this cup. Okay? He's not going to drink it again till we're in heaven. We get to do this as often as we will, as we said in a quote, in remembrance of him. Right? But he's not going to do it until then. In the Jewish family, when they, two families would get together and they wanted to have them, their, their children get married, there would be a negotiated price for the bride. And the two fathers would put a, a dowry together to make sure that the price was agreed upon of buying the bride. Jesus Christ died on the cross and bought our salvation. We in heaven leave the body of Christ here on earth and become the bride of Christ. Are y'all with me? We become the bride of Christ, right? Now here's what he's saying in John chapter 14. We've always quoted this passage, I am the way and the truth and the life that comes down a few verses later when, when Thomas doubts. But here's the thing I want you to get. He had just ended saying, I'm not going to drink until you get this. To seal the deal of the negotiations of a wedding, the groom would go over to the bride and would offer a cup of wine. If she drank the cup, that signified to both families and to that groom, I do. Drinking the cup meant there was going to be a marriage and we could celebrate. What is Jesus saying to the disciples? And by the way, here's what's interesting. Once that was done, the families would part until the groom got everything ready Bride and groom would not see each other. Sometimes it would take up to a year. The groom would begin building off the family house another room. Sometimes totally individual. I really believe that when it says in the Bible that Isaac took Rebekah in Sarah's tent, what they were saying was that it was an extension of a tent where Isaac took Rebekah to his mom's tent that had been prepared for her now. Rebecca, she drinks of this in their traditions. The groom would make the preparations and both families would make sure that they would never meet and see each other. And here's the cool thing about it. There would be an emissary between, usually it was a, a brother. The groom would pick a best man. Jesus Christ's best man is God's Holy Spirit to you and I. And how beautiful of a picture is that? He is the intermediate who speaks to our spirit and is the teacher that moves in our hearts and our lives. And we are awaiting, we are in the engagement. And what you just read there in verse 2 and 3 is he is preparing a place for us, our groom. And this ties right into communion with the Lord's table. And if I'm lying, I'm dying. He's going to drink with us, and there's going to be a celebration that's going to be above anything that we could ever imagine. So we get to practice it a little bit here. I don't think it was Ben Franklin that said practice makes perfect. But the Lord did say, or excuse me, Paul said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He quotes it from the Gospels. We are to do this as often as we want. Some churches do it every week. Some people do it every day. Some do it twice a year. We do it two or three times a year. So it's very clear that they took the bread. And Jesus said, this is my body. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And then he broke it and blessed it. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for the representation of Jesus' body through the bread. And we're thankful, Father, for what it means in the sense that you gave so willingly your son.
to have his body broken and bruised and battered. And may we be a living representation of that, of Jesus on the cross as the church. May we not be concerned about the trivial matters of things that are going around the world in all the preparations that it does, but may we simply show the mindset of a crucified Christ. May we live that life each and every day. May we understand that if we're first on earth, we're gonna be last in heaven, and may we be willing to be last on earth. May we have that simplistic mindset of the benefit of others. May we truly love our neighbor as a result. And may we be willing to be that part of the body. And we give you all the praise and honor and glory because you are the bread of life. And then they took the cup. I'm going to ask Marty if you wouldn't mind standing, asking God to bless the cup before you drink and thank the Lord for his blood. Father God, this, uh, thank you for the blood, Father. Shed the blood of your son Jesus that uh, cleanses all sin, Father. Thank you that uh, for your gift and the sacrifice of your son Jesus, that is the willingness to leave the splendor of heaven and to come to this lowly and close to earth. Amen. Live as a man and die a cruel death on the cross. Just be thankful for the blood that he shed that uh, gives us a cleanses our sins and gives us a relationship with you now. As we uh, partake of this, Father, we just uh, can't wait till the, the time that we are together with you in heaven and then go through the ceremony, Father. Yes. Great suffering. All the things that in Jesus' name. Amen. They left in a hymn and they crossed over that Kidron Valley where the blood was flowing from all those lambs, and here the perfect lamb of God was going. But I want to leave you today with the remembrance of this, guys. Once the groom got completed with the room, it was the fathers of the son who would make the proclamation. And he would make it in the presence of, in particular, the father of the bride. Because he's now leaving that family and here's what the father of the groom would say. Your room is completed. Go get your bride. Go get your bride. Come and get her now. When we walk out of here, realize that is the only thing that's left on God's calendar. is Jesus Christ coming back for his bride. Our Father, go with us today. We thank you, Father, that we've been able to be around your table. And we give you the praise, and we give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We love you guys. We'll see you Easter. <laughs>